Hello, my name is Jamie and I'm a geologist. What that means is I've spent the better part of my adult life explaining to people that I don't just study rocks. I've told this to my family, I've told this to my friends, I've told this to border control agents. Um, instead, I study the earth. And there are a lot of things that really excite me about the earth. For example, in the image that you see here, I study the interaction between the surface waters of the ocean and how those interact with the atmosphere to form the sort of swirling spheres that you see across the tropical ocean there. And those are the storm tracks that we know, the hurricanes that bring us all sorts of weather. I study very interesting interactions between life in the surface ocean with the water and the atmosphere. I study really interesting interactions between life on land with the soil and extreme environments. And what that's um, taught me to learn, which you can't say, it says dear inhabitants, is to understand and listen to the earth in a way that I think most of us don't really understand on a day-to-day -day life or in our day-to-day -day life. And so what I want to share with you today, over 20 years of research that I've been doing, are the sort of um, lessons learned. So how many of you have seen the figure over here on the left? If I show a hands, just a few. On the left here, what we're looking at is how CO2 is changing in our atmosphere. So that's carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, as you can see, since about 1956, has been rising. And we know that largely to David Keeling here, who started measuring the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere back in 1956. And for those of you who have a keen eye, instead of just the black line that you've been seeing, you can see this red line that sort of underlines that black line. Um, so if we look just the past five years, this red line you can see goes up and it goes down, um, and that's happening over an annual cycle. If you think about why that's actually happening, it's really fascinating. So most of the vegetation on Earth is located in the Northern Hemisphere, and the trees here as an example. So in, at the start of spring, trees start to get their leaves, they start to grow, they photosynthesize, and we would start at the top of one of these red peaks. And as those trees and plants in the northern hemisphere photosynthesize, they breathe in, and they breathe in the carbon dioxide. There's so many of them that we can actually measure that in the global atmosphere. And then during autumn and during winter, those trees, they lose their leaves, the plants start to become dormant, and that CO2 starts to increase again until spring comes again. So that's what we're seeing here. If that were the only thing that was happening on Earth in terms of the carbon dioxide, the black line that you see would just be a flat line hovering around whatever the concentration was in the atmosphere. But instead, we see that that's rising. And David Keeling, back as early as 1960, was able to tell that that was rising. And he was able to tell that that's due to fossil fuel burning and how we're changing land use. So. If we look again at the record from 1956 till today, being a geologist and studying the Earth allows me to think about things in longer time periods. The Earth's been around a lot longer than the rest of us have been, and so often we don't think about the very long time scales. So we can actually extend this record back through time by using ice cores that are over 3,000 meters long. They were collected by scientists, and they come from Antarctica. And they're able to look at the little bubbles within these ice cores and measure the atmosphere in those bubbles. And that gives us a record of how carbon dioxide has changed through much longer time periods. So the first one that I'm going to show you now is we're going back to 1700 AD. So I've I've extended time in that direction, which means the part we were looking at before is just here, all squished up to the top. So th this is the change that we were looking at from 1956 till present. And what you can see over 300 years of time instead is that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been rising since maybe around the mid-1800s or so. 
And we can see that the change in CO2 and the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing a lot more towards the present time, which is shown by the steepness of that line. So we can look back even further in time. We can go all the way to 10,000 years ago. And when we look across this time frame, carbon dioxide has been relatively stable over that time period in the global sense. And we can start to see that the changes that we're seeing today are a lot more obvious, um, and they're a lot more different from what we saw previously. And even though CO2 is quite stable during this time period, there are periods in time when there have been major cultural and uh, land changes. So if you were to time travel back 8,000 years ago, and you were going to go to the African Sahel, you would look around you and you would describe the landscape as green, wet, lush rivers. Um, whereas today, even though there were not huge global changes that happened at, over the course of time, today it would be a very arid landscape and if you were trying to make your living here, it would be quite difficult. Another example is the Mayan civilization, which around 1300 years ago, um, collapsed, and the collapse of the Mayan civilization is attributed to the droughts that they experienced along with social pressures, but you can see in this global record of carbon dioxide, very little was happening globally at the time, although locally there were very severe uh, droughts that occurred. So this is the furthest back in time we can extend our record from the Vostok ice core. This is 800,000 years ago. And you can see today is all the way up here. One of the things that you might see in the record is we're seeing sort of cycles similar to what we saw on an annual basis from the trees breathing in and breathing out. And what this is actually showing us is what the Earth is doing over very long time scales, almost as a built-in thermostat. So you can see that these periods of time where there's rises, happen really quickly, and those are warming periods going into interglacials, similar to where we are today. And the long, long cooling trends that we see going down, these are glacial periods. These are periods where a large part of the northern hemisphere is actually covered in miles of ice, so very thick ice. And it's what we can see is, and what we know is, is that these high CO2, fast CO2 events correspond with very quick warming temperatures. There's feedbacks in the system that amplify those. But the main processes Earth has for this cooling is to dissolve mountains and dissolve rocks. So rainwater dissolving granite. So if you dripped rainwater on your kitchen counter made of granite until it dissolved, those are the sort of time scales it takes for the Earth naturally to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So if we look at the kind of changes that are happening today, scientists have been able to do a lot of clever things to understand what's happening. And one of the ones that concerns me that I want to share with you is about ocean heat content. So they've been able to go back to very early measurements of ocean temperatures. This is the Challenger. Um, this is an expedition that went out in the late 1800s. And they're able to combine the measurements from these shipboard measurements with more recent um, high-tech kind of measurements. And what you can see here is back from those original measurements um, on the Challenger, how ocean heat content has changed. So in the light blue here, if you can make it out, that's the surface ocean. In the medium blue, that's kind of the middle ocean. And in the dark blue here, what you're seeing is we're, ma we're making measurable changes to the heat content of the ocean down below two kilometers. So a very large volume of water. And the thing that concerns me is that in the first 132 years of the record, there's been 150 zettajoules of energy absorbed. And it doesn't concern me because I know what a zettajoule is because I don't. <laughs> um, but it concerns me because if you look from 1997 to 2015 in the record, the same amount 
of heat energy has been absorbed as it took 132 years to absorb previously. Um, in terms of a zettajoule, um, one joule is the amount of energy it would take to lift an apple. So you can't see it here because of the lights, but one zettajoule is 10 to the 21 joules. So 10 to the 21 apples you'd have to be able to carry to equal a zettajoule. And the authors explain that as being, if you dropped an atomic bomb the size of Hiroshima um, every second for a year, that would be two zettajoules. And so what we're talking about within those 18 years that we've put 150 zettajoules in, that would be the equivalent of basically exploding a Hiroshima bomb every second for 75 years which is a humanly inconceivable amount of energy that we're storing in the oceans. Um, what do we know about what happens with the energy in the oceans? We know that ocean heat content drives things like storms and storm tracks and the intensity of storm tracks. Um, and although that was a tropical one that we just looked at, some of my research is looking at what happens. This is showing the atmosphere how the jet stream moves from North America across the Atlantic Ocean towards the UK, towards Europe. And I study places both in the UK and in Europe. And unfortunately, the projection <laughs> for the UK is that we're going to get wetter. So we're going to be kind of stuck in this phase where a lot of water gets delivered to us. But you'll notice down here in Spain, while these sort of images might be more common here, in Spain, where I do research, aridity is continuing to happen. So I study some of these environments that are very high in elevation, and it's because they're very sensitive to climate, and they kind of give us a forewarning of what's happening. In these sites that I study, so this is one of the lakes that I study down here, La Mosca, um, this catchment has lost all of its glaciers, and in fact, the Sierra Nevada in southern Spain is the first mountain range to lose all of its glaciers, and it lost them back in 1920. Um, this here, similar to the ice cores, are the kind of records that I work with. This is mud from the bottom of the lake that I had just shown you a picture of. And what we know from investigating this lake mud and the things that it contains is that these sites have already warmed over two degrees in terms of summer temperatures. And we know that the warming that's happening in these high elevation sites is higher than anything we've seen in the last 2,000 years. And so I just, these are the things that sort of concern me and I think that other people need to hear about. If you've paid attention to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they've had a report that came out in 2018 and what they suggested that there's major consequences for us overshooting that 1.5 degree target. If we, if we overshoot it by even half of a degree, some of the things that they talk about are that insects will be twice as likely to lose half of their habitat. 99% of corals will go extinct rather than in the current scenarios under 1.5 degrees they have a 10% chance of surviving. And then we know too that, as, as we just looked at heat content, as you warm water, it expands. In addition to melting ice sheets, um, sea level rise, if we hit that two degree mark, would affect 10 million more people than it's predicted to hit at the moment. So sorry, this doesn't come up quite right. But, this is the reason why um, many people, such as Jim Hansen, who used to be the director of NASA Goddard, who makes all the climate models, um, prominent environmental attorneys and concerned citizens are getting together and they're trying to get the message out that climate change is happening. Um, in terms of it being an emergency, it's something that the scientific community has felt all the way back since the 70s. Jim Hansen was testifying in front of Congress in the US. And I think if the Earth were to speak to us today, it would 
ask us to give the earth a voice and basically say that it's not too late, but we need to act collaboratively and we need to act now. So thank you.